what journalism is is debatable but to me it's 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 punching up right it's like criticizing power structures it's trying to visibilize abuses not negate or defend or write apology for them Welcome back to the Non-Serbian Podcast. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and my internet studio ether guest is Joshua Collins, all the way down in Bogota, Colombia. Hi, Lucy. Thanks for having me on. I'm very excited to talk to you today. Let, let me describe you. Joshua Collins became a freelance journalist by accident after he ended up living on the Colombian-Venezuelan border in 2017, also by accident. This is very... This invites follow-up questions and stories. His career was driven primarily in the beginning by simply being willing to go to regions no one else would. He is now focused on borders, social movements, and the impact of criminality on human rights. And, um, well, we'll let him pitch kind of his freelance writing and his own pirate wire services. But can we start talking about how you might describe your politics? Oh, wow. Um that's a really good question. I think that there's still information. Um, but one example I have really clear in my mind is that I was born in Texas and am outside of Dallas, but later in my adolescence, spent a lot of time in the border areas. And uh, at that period, that would be like the Clinton administration, I guess, and then after. That was when border policy really started to change in the, in the United States, right? That's when we first started to see like mass roundups of migrants and as time passed, you know, I, I was very against those policies. I remember as a kid, we would go to Mexico to get drunk and come back. And it wasn't even a big deal, right? Like, I didn't even have a driver's license at the time. Like, I could just walk across the border. Um, you know, and then now compared to what we see, which is like a hyper militarized, one of the most draconian anti-migration policies the U.S. has ever operated under, Um so for me, it's like I kind of left the United States in 2017 as somebody who was kind of opposed to U.S. border policy. But then after spending years in those borders, I became really radicalized, I guess you could say, against like all border policy. Um, in my opinion, it's like you can't enforce convention of migration without empowering organized crime, violating human rights, and basically stripping the global south of their ability to advance themselves economically. And I'm kind of monologuing, but it seems like a very intentional policy from not just the U.S., but from Europe as well to keep the global south in submission economically, socially, as far as security. Uh, it's like there's there's tiers of citizenship in our world. We live in this big system with these invisible walls everywhere. Um, my politics more generally would be kind of leftist, anti-authoritarian, I guess, but I don't think I'd quite qu- qualify myself as an anarchist. I do like some anarchist thinkers. What kind of anarchist thinking do you like? Um, well, so the reason I say that I wouldn't qualify myself exactly as an anarchist is because while I'd love to abolish money and private property, I don't see that as realistic right now at the point that um, you know the global, the global world is at. So it seems kind of idealistic. Uh, it seems to me, and you probably disagree, but if somehow someone managed to get rid of private property right, right now, tomorrow, I feel like the people who hold power would just reinvent it. It seems like there are some other steps that need to be taken first, in my humble opinion. I mean, I could go off on a big old tangent about private property there. I mean, I like private property. I count, I come from libertarian land, so uh-huh. I used to use the terrible, the, the, the ANCAP word, and then I realized that the people who used that were the worst people on earth. So I'm having a journey. Too, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I completely understand. Um, but we call, you know, we're kind of a market anarchist thing over here. So we, okay, cool. We make, we make everyone confused, I guess. Um, no, I totally get that. I'm very used to, to being in the minority when it comes to my political view. So I can identify with that perspective. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, how long have you been doing journalism? Is that, does that predate your trip down South or, um, well, I left the United States in 2017. I was looking for somewhere in Latin America to live. I had studied Spanish in college, although I wasn't fluent. I was conversational. And originally, my plan was to go on a trip starting in Colombia and continue west to Ecuador, Peru, Chile, and Argentina and find a spot 
find a job that I could do remotely. And uh, I never left Columbia. I mean, I've left Columbia since that moment, but I just fell in love with Columbia and I fell in love with a Colombian woman. And that's how I ended up on the Venezuelan border in 2017. And that was um, right at the beginning of the height of the Venezuelan exodus, right? The giant mass migration that happened. And it was a big story at the time. And I was, I had always been really interested in writing. And I, so I started pitching all these media companies. Nobody really cared. And then around 2018, 2019, when relations between the U.S. and Venezuela deteriorated, and there was even a moment where some people thought that Trump might initiate a military intervention in 2019, uh, a lot of editors started responding to me. I think I was one of like 10 people in Bucata that spoke English at the time. So all of a sudden I had work. And then after that, um, as I mentioned in the, the bio I wrote rather quickly, that whole region of the Venezuelan Colombian border, there's a lot more stories than just the Venezuelan migration there. Um, Catatumbo, just to the north, is the biggest coca producing region in the country, one of the biggest in the world. Uh, it's run by ELN, leftist rebels that control the region. The government does not have control there. Just south in Arauca and Meta, there are also regions where there's a lot of smuggling conflicts between arm groups. When I first started out, after I kind of got some bylines doing migration, uh, I would just offer editors, look, I'll go to I'll go to Arauca and we can do stories about that if you're interested. And, you know, I, I like being a journalist. It seems important work to me. Um, there's always a dynamic to freelancing that can be a little frustrating. But I have to admit that it helped me a little bit is that U.S. media is always interested in cocaine stories, right? But since then, um, you know, the protests in 2021 were a military response, just those most last recent protests. So for about three months, I was on those protests every day in three major cities in Colombia. I started writing a bit more about the peace process as well. You're probably aware, but maybe the listeners aren't, that Colombia emerged from a 50-year civil war, 53-year civil war. Uh, the same year I arrived in Colombia, that's when the peace deal was, was signed in 2017, so implemented. And there's still a lot of after effects socially, and the protests were, were related to some of those things, although they weren't the only cause. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was 50 years. Um, I mean, what what kind of reporting do you do? Because, like, my initial thought is that it's not normal American reporting, though you are an American, technically, in America. Um. Yeah, so for, for a living, mostly what I do is freelance writing, right? So I don't have a, a post, a permanent position at any media company. Um, so... Primarily what I cover for my, my primary source of income are stories about Colombian politics, Colombian social movements. And then, as I mentioned about the peace process and how a lot of it hasn't really worked, there are large regions of the country which are stateless, right? Like, they're technically part of Colombia, but they're not controlled by the Colombian government. And some of those um, are controlled by criminal armed groups. Some of those are controlled by leftist rebel groups. Some of them are controlled by indigenous communities, right? So it's, it's, you get this really large spectrum of what like stateless society can look like. And one of my frustrations, although this isn't for all Colombian journalists, there are a ton of Colombian journalists I admire very much that take huge risks to do what they do. But unfortunately, the main media system here is kind of dominated by three right-wing companies that have TV um, radio and the biggest newspapers in the country. And most of those reporters don't leave Bogota, right? Like, so they're making phone calls and, and stuff like that. It can be a little frustrating. So what I've been trying to do is visibilize some of what's going on in some of these other regions of the country. Yeah, that's, that's mostly stuff about the peace process and conflict. Sometimes drugs come into that. Obviously those are all related issues. And then we also have uh, a media collective Hardware Services, that is and me and three other journalists, Daniela Diaz here in Bogota, and two Argentinian journalists, one of whom, Pablo Chavez, is from uh, Peru, but also uh, reports and lived in Ecuador for a while. And the story behind that is pretty cool. So in 2021, when the protests were going on here, the ones I described briefly a moment ago, I always, as I spent time on the streets, especially in Cali, that's the city where it was the most violent. Like there was you know, the police were attacking with live bullets sometimes at protesters at night. And we were really frustrated with the international coverage. And I don't want to say it was intentional because I don't think it was. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of reporters that flew in, didn't really understand the context of Columbia, were writing for big media companies, and, and were doing all of their reporting from, like, 
the the big safe parade in Bogota that would happen every day, right? Mm-hmm. And we felt that the international community wasn't getting a very good idea of what was actually in the beginning. That changed, but in the first month, we felt like the international community wasn't getting a real sense of what was happening. So uh, we started this collective of about 20 different journalists, most of them Colombian, most of them freelancers. And it wasn't a media company. It was a Telegram channel and a Twitter account, and everyone was using hashtags. The idea was to visibilize on-the-street coverage to the international community. And we all knew that the project had an expiration date. It was just an experiment for, ended up being about two to three months. But it was really cool, and I liked the collaborative leaderless model, and I liked the work that we visibilized, and you know, a lot of Colombian journalists, we were translating their stuff and putting it into our feeds. And I, I just really loved, I fell in love with the idea. And we jokingly called it Pirate Wire Services because the idea was it was a wire service, much like traditional media operates. Anyone can use those stories if they want, mm-hmm. but ours was radical, right? And so the, the project was... Of what Pirate Wire Services is now was inspired by that experiment, and so it's. Yeah, I like the origin story of all that. I like it too. Um, mm. Can I ask how frustrating pitching to you mentioned uh, working on something for the New Republic, for example? How hard is it to get any bites in the uh, U.S. media community for things based where you are? Because well, I think that Colombia has an advantage over some other Latin American companies, uh, excuse me, a Latin American countries, in that for some reason, and I can't really explain exactly why, U.S. media is really interested in Colombia and Colombian stories, much more so than, say, Uruguay or Paraguay or Ecuador or Peru. I mean, of course, those stories will occasion, I mean, those countries will occasionally make the headlines. Um, it could be because the U.S. is a close partner of Colombia. Uh, it could be because of the mysticism surrounding the narcos here, you know, has been popularized by some Netflix series and stuff. Um, I also just think that Colombia has a really interesting history, right? Like that amidst the Civil War, there were massive purges of leftist parties. There was crackdowns of civil liberties, mass killings of farmers who were, who were claimed to be rebels, right? There was... So you have this really dramatic backdrop, I feel like, in Colombia. So in that sense, I feel like I'm a little bit lucky. I think it's easier to pitch stories about Colombia than you know, Uruguay, as I mentioned. Um, but in another sense, I feel like the stories kind of have to fit a mold often to get published in, in you know, large media companies. Like I, I only half jokingly was talking about cocaine. Like if I'm ever short of work, I'm like, I'm going to pitch a cocaine story. Like I know they'll take it. (laughs) So I get a little frustrated with some, like sometimes if there's a social movement, my editors will be like, okay, but we we've, we've seen like 30 of these social movements. Oh, it's an indigenous group and they don't like big mining. Okay, great. They don't really care. Right. Like, (laughs) so I mean, there are problems with the media model, and I get a little frustrated with that. I feel generally I'm pretty lucky. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe it's on me that I learned the um, president of Columbia's name like 37 minutes ago. Um, nice. <laughs> Gustavo Petro. He's an interesting. He's a very interesting character. Uh, yeah, he's an ex-guerrilla. He was once imprisoned by the country he now live. Uh, he now leads. Excuse me. First leftist president in modern Colombian history, arguably the first ever. It's kind of an interesting story. I mean, that's that's a great background. I was just your piece about um, his stance on the drug war and his surprisingly to me, whatever, I don't know anything, um, uh, the war on drugs being an abject failure. I'm always, I love to see politicians say such bold statements, but then um, your piece went on to talk about how that was clearly easier said than done and yeah um I, I i have plenty of criticisms about petro but i do like his stance at least in theory on the war on drugs uh but yeah his policy has been very moderate compared to his campaign promises i suppose is the shortest way to describe that that's almost always the way i suspect <laughs> right some more specific misconceptions about Colombia and I don't want to like put Latin America in one giant container, but I feel like even as somebody who has been to Central America, 
and who tries to know about stuff that I still give Latin America sort of the short end of the stick attention wise a lot of the time. Um, I think that's pretty understandable. Um, I think I talked to my mom, for example, she lives in St. Louis, Missouri, and I think that she's relatively well informed when it comes to politics in the U S but she just generally has no clue about politics in Colombia, nor much interest. And to, for me, because I'm physically in Colombia and exposed to that world all the time, obviously it's important to me. But to be fair, like, you know, I don't wake up thinking about what's going on in Finland or Belarus. Mm-hmm. You know? It's like, I just, sure, I might read a headline or two, but I, I don't claim to be an expert. I think that's pretty normal. We tend to focus on the regions that affect us, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, the U.S. affects um, S- South America. Yeah, I think the U.S. is more in the news here than we are in the U.S. news. That's certainly, certainly That makes true. sense. Um, but as far as misconceptions, I mean, we could talk about that for the entire episode. Uh, but I'll try to stick with just Colombia. As I mentioned, that there's a lot of stereotypes about Colombia. I mean, cocaine and Pablo Escobar obviously being the biggest I think another misconception about Colombia is that it's like this horrible post-war zone, right? Like it's dangerous. The rebels are going to kidnap you. That's just not true, at least not in the cities that tourists go to. I mean, Bogota has a lower murder rate than New York City. Uh, Cartagena on the coast is a huge, huge destination for international tourism. Medellin in recent years has been like overwhelmed with foreigners who want to live there because the city is so beautiful and relatively cheap if you're earning in euros or dollars. And yeah, there's street crime everywhere in every city in the world, of course. But in those regions, they aren't very dangerous. Um, I mean, of course, there are parts of Colombia that are still dangerous, but you're never going to go there for tourism. I think that's probably the biggest misconception, at least that I encounter when I'm talking to my U.S. friends. They view it as this kind of I don't know. They view the coast as sort of like a archetypical paradise with like women and bikinis, and then they view the interior as like scary and dangerous, right? <laughs> but it's not like that. The two genders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Now, what do do specifically? What do leftists get wrong about Latin America? I feel like I'm speaking to broadly here but no 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 that's a really good question and in fact um this is something that i used to encounter more when i was doing coverage on the migration initially in 2018 it was very non-political coverage it was human rights stories uh humanitarian emergency stories because it was it's it's indisputable i mean eight million people have fled that country right this is this is a fact i saw it happen and there were points where it was surreal to watch. Like I could go to the border and there'd be tens of thousands of people, you know, uh, thousands leaving tens of thousands capitalizing on that movement, selling them goods, transportation, whatever. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions from leftists that I got writing about this issue is they would attack me. They'd be like, well, you're trying to, to overthrow the socialist revolution. I'm like, no, I'm just writing about migrants, man. Like I don't have anything to do with the politics. And I think that there's a lot of reasonable motives to suspect U.S. involvement all over Latin America for many reasons. And you can just look at the history that the U.S. has had in various parts. I mean, as recently as 2009, we were supporting coups in Honduras, you know, and these things happened. So it's like I get the skepticism. But I think that a lot of at least online leftists, uh, what they, what they, that skepticism goes so far that they end up supporting – really authoritarian governments like in Nicaragua or um, denials about human rights violations in Venezuela. Like these are not conspiracy theories. We have the data about this, right? And I think that there's a mistake that just because somebody is anti-American interests in Latin America, some authoritarian leftists think that that means they're a good actor. And that's just a really dangerous assumption to make, right? I mean, that's what we call tankies among other things. The one of my uh, people over here was also reintroducing me to the term campists, and I had to ask him what the difference between tankies and campists was. <laughs> yeah, I think we could have a whole conversation. <laughs> I, I don't really use the word tanky anymore, although I love the origin of where it comes from. You have to love it, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, I think it's been kind of adopted, and a lot of centrists now will use it to mean anyone who isn't a centrist, and I don't think that's a very useful definition. Another reason to hate centrists if they took tanky from us, because that is that's a right. great insult. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I just feel like this is the constant refrain with you know something like Ukraine also, where it's like, because the U.S. meddled somewhere, it means that all people in that country are puppets and have no will desires of their own i mean yeah and that's something that i think that a lot of a lot of observers in the u.s think about latam more broadly and that's that the people don't have agency right like Mm -hmm. and that's frustrating to me it seems to be another like a perverted expression of u.s exceptionalism like nothing good or bad can happen in latam unless the u.s did it right like no that's ridiculous that's absurd I mean, that's just another way to center the U.S. in every discussion ever. Only they're real. I mean, the people in these countries don't even, they're not even real people. They're just puppets. So. Yeah, of course. Right. They're, they work for Soros and the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? Wait, don't we all work for Soros? It, it's um, true. He's, he's founding, he's funding PirateWire. We're so rich. That, that's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> you can pass some to, for a non serviums way. I'll take some Soros. but. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you also about your, when was this from August, 2020, um, your piece for our buddies at center for a stateless society. Um, oh yeah. We, we love them here. They're our friends. Nice. Um, and it was about how to cover ethically cover social unrest, which I think is a very interesting topic because I mean, any of us who have journalistic urges have probably at one time had the urge to, you know, snap a really badass riot photo of something, mm-hmm. but like, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, how are we doing that now? Like, yeah, that was a really, that was a really fun piece. They wrote, they reached out to me because I was covering the protests in Colombia and I had friends there. Um, yeah. I, again, I think that's a whole other conversation, but I do think that especially, I mean, you're well aware of this, but especially in the digital age we live in, it's so easy for well-intentional material that's meant to say, I don't know, shed light on a social movement to be abused by the state trying to crack down on that social movement. There's the inverse dynamic where sometimes I've been to protests that are so anti-media that they end up not getting any coverage. And I feel like that's also not very productive, right? Like, so finding an ethical balance between those two extremes seems like an important idea to me. Yeah, I mean, I guess in in general, I want to poke at you about media, you know, critique the media. No one likes the media anymore, right? So (laughs) to you, what's the biggest problems with it? I mean, you're a guy who's pounding the pavement, as my my ex-journalist father would, would describe it. And that's obviously less of a thing anymore. But, like, fix the media for me. Okay, well, that's going to be impossible but i can i can offer hopefully a few suggestions and talk about what i like to do from an ethical perspective uh i i really although i'm relatively new to journalism i've only been doing it what like six and a half years now uh, i've always been really enamored with beat reporters right you called it in the pavement and i feel like as you mentioned that becomes less and less and i see that personally here in columbia a lot although i i I admire them. I've met almost all of the foreign correspondents who live here, right? Like I know at least have met people at the New York Times, people at Washington Post, the people at the Guardian, and they all have really good intentions Mm -hmm. and they all have, they're all really smart and they write well and they're studied, they read the reports, but I feel like a lot of them are just making phone calls from Bogota. I mean, the New York Times is an exception, actually. They do a lot of field work, but a, a lot of the other ones, it's like in a year, they'll spend 11 months in the capital and one month in the regions they're writing about. Right now, that's just, um, that's not their fault. Like their pay isn't great. You know, it's, it's just a, a side effect of the modern model of media. I mean, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the New York times had a bureau here, right? They had 20 reporters and they had people that were writing from the field. There was a lot more money in the media at that point. Right. So they could afford to pay those correspondents. Now, most of the offices are four or five people who are doing all the work for that country. And, and the, 
the example of Columbia, both the Washington Post and the New York Times, they cover all of the Andes. So they're covering everything from Colombia to Peru to Ecuador and South. So it's like, that's an incredibly difficult and challenging job, right? Yeah. And it's not the faults of the reporters. It's the faults of our new media model. And I don't know, that's where my prescription starts to fail. I don't know how to change that. But one of the things that we've been trying to do with Pirate Wire is I do think that there is a lot of promise in direct journalism, the audience, models. I don't know which one's perfect. I don't think we've found the perfect one or have created the perfect one. But I do think that model bears exploration. And it also is kind of cool in one sense because it opens the gates of who is a journalist and who is not. There's a democratization of the process there, which I think is pretty cool, mostly. It also lets some jokers get in, which can be frustrating, but that's the price I suppose we we pay for that. It's Yeah, I mean, anybody can become a journalist. You don't even need to go to school or nothing. No, I totally, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I don't think it's it's a recommendation that will fix the business model. But I do strongly believe that media companies generally, traditionally, and in many ways still to this day are dominated by white people from middle upper classes. And that's just a fact, right? They're the ones who went to J school. They're the ones who had the $10,000 to come spend six months here before they got a job. And I, I, I think that this is opening the doors to a more diverse and and more fair policy and reporting. Yeah, I mean, a lot of those people make me feel poor and disadvantaged. And I, oh, yeah, I came, right. I came from a very middle class um, upbringing, but not, you know, I couldn't afford to have a, a an unpaid internship in New York or sort of the traditional things that get you up in the world. So Right, right. Or come live in Columbia for a year and not have to worry about actually paying the rent because you're only here to get 10 bylines before you go back to New York and take a staff job somewhere. That still exists. That still happens. Sounds kind of nice in some ways, but clearly yeah. a big problem. Um, who do you think besides you and your work, I don't know who's, who's doing uh, journalism well or what publications, I guess, do you, do you read? I don't really feel married to any particular media organization. Um, I guess I tend to follow journalists' work a lot. Mm -hmm. Like if I find somebody who seems interesting, I might, you know, put them on a list and Mastodon or Twitter or whatever and kind of keep up with their work. Um, There isn't really like a bellwether that I think is ideal. Um, I tend to follow journalists, I guess, that are, are... at least do some field work. That is a really important idea to me. Um, I also consume a lot of media now in Spanish, obviously, because I'm in Colombia. So <laughs> that might not be very helpful for your listeners. Uh, but I, mean, I think there are a lot of journalists in Latin America that are doing some really good work. Um, I tend to look more for people in countries that are veering towards authoritarianism because it's difficult to trust the media companies that are allowed to operate in those circumstances. So when I find someone who is doing that work, like in El Salvador, for example, or Honduras or Nicaragua, like I tend to pay attention to their work because it's hard for me to find uh, reliable sources, I guess, for what's going on in those regions. I just noticed your Pirate Wire Services piece that's titled Elections Under Attack, Authoritarianism on the Rise in Central America. Another feels overly broad thing, but it feels in the last, you know, since you left America, coincidence, it seems like a lot of the world authoritarianism is on an upswing in a way. Um, I don't know if you see anything more positive um, in terms of, of, I mean, we talked about the president of Colombia. I, I don't know. I'm not a, a global geopolitical expert on why, mm-hmm. but I do agree that globally authoritarianism has been on the rise since roughly the time I left the United States when Trump was president. And I don't know why, uh, at least globally. But I, because I spend a lot of time studying Latin and Central America, I can kind of see some of the reasons on why here. And I have a really concrete example. So a year ago, I was commissioned to write a piece about the overcrowding of prisons in Latin America. And this is a subject that I knew almost nothing about. 
Uh, but I spent, you know, a few weeks talking to experts and I visited a couple of jails here in Colombia. And what everyone told me, and it didn't matter what their political background was, is what they told me is, if you want to win an election in Latin America, you have to promise to be tough on crime. So that ends up in this, you know, reinforcing pattern where it's like a candidate gets elected and he says, okay, we're going to put everybody in jail who's breaking the law. And you end up with this constantly eroding model of civil rights, right? And nobody cares about prisoners because you can't get elected being like, I'm going to reform prisons. They're terrible. We need to treat prisoners better. Well, your opponent says, this man is defending rapists and murderers, and that person doesn't win the election, right? So what you see is like over a long period of time, like a long arc towards more punitive measures and more draconian security measures. And Central America has been a really dramatic example of that in the last year, last two years. Bailey and Honduras now copying some of his crackdowns. I mean, one of the statistics that keeps that really sticks out to me about El Salvador is that they've arrested one percent of the population in less than a year. I saw that. Over two percent of the population jailed surpassed the U.S. as the highest per capita prison rate. And his policies are wildly popular. And it's it's that same model. It's a very extreme example of that model, right? But And then I think that it's also important to keep in mind that although plenty of Latin America's problems are self-generated, plenty more aren't. Uh, the war on drugs, for example, all of the push factors for migration, uh, U.S. militarization, and sometimes in in recent history, the U.S. supporting mil uh, political destabilization as well. So it's like these, these countries aren't occurring in a vacuum, right? They have plenty of agency to make terrible decisions themselves, of course. But a lot of this is exacerbated by U.S. policy in the region as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm mo more familiar with Guatemala, which I very briefly have been to. And there are 30 years civil war and how much you know, how unhelpful the U.S. was in that department. And I know that well, they story were super is super helpful at killing people. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's true. Whatever definition, whatever your goal is. It's um, a dark joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm less of an expert on Guatemala. I have visited briefly. And basically, the perception to me seemed to be there that people are just so distrustful of any sort of establishment politics there, right? Like it's not a matter of being left or right. They're like, no, nah, those guys are thieves and murderers. They're politicians. It's just a very normal statement to make. Like, <laughs> they feel like yeah, fuck those guys, man. Like, I mean, that's, that's a very I mean, agreeable. Reasonably sentiment. so. I yeah. totally understand the point of view. Yeah. So of course uh, that can always backfire and give you like, Trumpy weirdos and stuff. Yeah, which is exactly how Bukele came to power in El Salvador in a very similar situation. As El Salvador emerged from their civil war, distrust in any sort of political establishment, basically, they're, they're trying out, like, a, he's not a dictator yet. He probably will be. Before we're talking to this guy, this conversation next year, I bet that he's a dictator. Like, I have very little doubts about that. <laughs> I guess, I don't know where that magical line is, but it's, it's true. Uh, it's debatable. Getting close. Right? It's, yeah, something it's, has gone very wrong. <laughs> it's debatable. I don't know when that line gets crossed. I don't think it's been crossed in El Salvador yet, but I think that they're dangerously close. Yeah, I mean, that prison stuff. And also, of course, the tough on crime stuff. I mean, God, you, you make it sound so accessible for someone like me who was overly immersed in U.S. politics, you know. Mm -hmm. We're all the same in some ways, aren't we? Yeah, no, it's true. I think that there are dynamics that stretch across all governmental systems globally. You asked me to define my politics earlier. I, you know, talking about this, I think I can define them a little better now. They're kind of vague when it comes to the political compass. Like if you want to put an exact dot somewhere on it, to describe me. But I could describe them as just saying, I distrust the effect that power has on human beings. And so I distrust power systems. I think that that's, that's very clear. That's, that's a great start and almost a great end, too, um, right? in terms of uh, political belief. The stuff I've seen from you seems pretty classic news, what we used to be like, objective news, you know? Like mm -hmm. you're not you how much of you is in your pieces do you think how much of your bias and you know your 
your distrust of political systems, for example? Like that's a great question. Um, I, I want to before I answer it, I want to kind of clarify one point that I think is really important when we talk about uh, the classic model of journalism. Right? Mm -hmm. I think the classic model of journalism was for big legacy companies to pretend that they were objective. And I think that that's just a lie, right? Like everyone, I know, like I said, the journalists who are writing for the Guardian, they have opinions. They like, they're, they're, they're writing from a point of bias. Like we are human beings, right? So I feel in one sense that it's kind of dishonest to try and claim otherwise, but I do think that you can make up for the bias that we all have, that I have, that you have, that any writer has, and we can make up for it by, by doing a thorough job, right? And so one of the, the ideas that's important to me is if I'm interviewing someone and I hate their politics, like hate their politics, it's I'm still going to try to present their best argument, right? Like sometimes I see in journalism, it's like the journalist obviously had a long conversation with someone and picked like the worst thing the guy said to put in the piece. I don't think that's very fair, right? Um Getting back to what you actually asked me, though, that's a dynamic that I try to do in my work. Um, obviously, my, I have a little more freedom in my social media accounts. Mm -hmm. But for me, and this is just my model, I can't say whether other people should follow it or not. I, I think that there's a difference between activism and journalism, and you should choose to do one or the other. I think trying to do both in my opinion, is a bit dangerous. You end up engaging in the debate and politicizing the debate more than just being an observer. And like I said, this is a debatable point, but that's like the, mm -hmm. the philosophy that I'm trying to espouse in my work. Well, speaking of difficult lines, where would the um, line between journalism and activist be for you? Like what would be a line that you don't want to cross over? So I see a lot of, I need to phrase this carefully. I think that in the new media ecosystem, there are a lot of independent journalists. And I think that that's good. That's fantastic. I also think, though, that there are a lot of journalists whose work has more political motives than anything else. And so you'll see journalists that will spend their time defending state power structures because they happen to like the philosophy of the government, right? We see this, we saw this in Colombia when Duque was in charge. There were right-wing journalists that just really loved neoliberalism and they would write about how great it was, right? Uh, from the right-wing perspective. I mean, we see it from the left-wing perspective as well. I mean, there are journalists, Western journalists in Nicaragua who are just rewriting press releases. And to me, it's like, oh, but that's not what journalism is to me. And what journalism is, is debatable. But to me, it's, it's, it's punching up, right? It's like criticizing power structures. It's trying to visibilize abuses, not negate or defend or write apology for them. So when you ask me what the line between activism and journalism is, I don't know if I can describe every instance, but that seems like a very clear violation to me, right? That's, that's veering away so far into activism that it's almost propaganda, and that's, that's a very different subject. It gets a little more confusing, though, when you start talking about Citizen journalism and protests are a great example, right? Like, if, in my opinion, if you're on the street documenting a protest, you're a journalist. I don't care who you work for, how you actually make your money. You're doing journalism, right? And I understand the urge to provide sympathetic coverage for a movement that might not be getting much attention from traditional press structures, that's where it's a little harder for me to define where the line is, right? I understand reading sympathetic coverage from protesters that I consider good work. But I do feel like there's also a line where if you go too far into activism, you end up damaging your credibility a little bit, um, even if it's well-intentioned. And I think that that's something that I try to avoid. I also think this new media model allows for some journalists to make a brand out of doing exactly that, right? Like, so if, if your brand is, I write sympathetic journalism coverage from the left or the right or whatever it is, right? Like you, I feel like the new model allows journalists to kind of create a brand. And I think as long as they're being honest with their audience about their biases, that's not, that's not the same as writing propaganda for the government of Nicaragua, right? Those are very different situations. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, that, no, that all makes sense. Um, 
here's my attempt at a segue with that is so I was reading, um, I believe, I don't know if it was in the Atlantic, an article about Lauren Southern, the alt-right queen who made a habit of doing horrible anti-immigrant activities. Um, oh no. <laughs> and there's, there were some descriptions of her like inter interviewing, um, uh, immigrants in Europe and all the stuff that sounded like, God, I wish I had the funds to do that sort of <laughs> journalism. Yeah. And here's this person with a very clear agenda that I said, you and I do not like, um, going through the motions, I guess, of being that reporter on the ground. So I don't know. That's weird, but yeah, no, it, it's annoying. And that's a shame because it's, it's, it's casting a negative light on, on journalistic integrity beyond her, right? Like she does it for attention mm -hmm. and she does it to, to push this viewpoint. But the average layman who doesn't spend much time thinking about migration is like they see these incendiary comments from her and like oh, she's an idiot. A journalist, the media is terrible. Look at this terrible media, right? It's really a shame. But I mean, I guess if you or I were doing those similar motions and we had an agenda of, gee, these people are fleeing, you know, Syria for um, a good reason. Would we, I mean, is that activism? I, I get what I you're saying. Know. Yeah, I can't yeah. really answer that question. Um, I think that we all have truth that we believe and some of those truths are not objective right like there are plenty of objective truths in the world but when it comes to political opinion what is a truth to me might not be a truth to you and so we end up in this situation where it's like you might view something i wrote as being ideologically driven and it probably was if you think that right but we might disagree on whether that 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 motive is a truth or not or at least objectively a truth, right? And so I think that that leads to some a lot of gray areas. And I know I agree. I think that the most important thing to keep in mind for all journalists is that we might encounter information that contradicts our original viewpoint. Now, so I think about this a lot when I write articles. You're well aware the article has to have a lead, right? Like the the thesis, the, uh, the or the the snappy attention point that that gets the reader's attention, that pulls the piece together. Um, and I've had stories where I pitched a story and I pitched a lead and the editor said yes. And I started looking into it. And I was like, wait a minute, this is not at all what I thought was going on. This is, and this is completely opposed, actually. And sometimes that means the story gets spiked. Sometimes it means that it results in a better story because it, who knew what we were going to uncover, right? And I think that's a really, we're all going to have struggles with how to deal with that when it happens. But I think it's an important idea to try and incorporate and be thorough in our work, right? That it, clearly that woman you described is not doing that. Like if she, if she, if she encounters some Syrian on the beach, whose like family just drowned and whose like brother was tortured for years, she's not going to put him on the show when it finally comes out. Right. Like that's not going to be in the final video. Like there's a difference there. Right? She's not doing thorough work. If we're asking ourselves these questions, we're probably doing better than a lot of people too, you know? to even like wonder what's like, if we're being intellectually honest, that's, that's a good first step to actually being intellectually It's a honest. crucial step. I yeah. agree. Yeah, you're right. You're totally right. Um, I want to circle all the way back to the beginning a little bit though, with um, first with growing up near the Texas border. I mean, you say during the Clinton eight years and stuff back when it was is easy. Well, I remember when you could go to Canada without a passport and that's mm -hmm. not true anymore. Um, I feel like you get a lot of people claiming if, you know, I all, all here in Pennsylvania where we have a bizarre, like almost complete lack of Hispanic immigrants for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, like we don't know what the border's like, you know, like when we would, I would be much more in favor of borders if I saw it for myself and that sort of thing. I mean, but you saw it, you've seen it. So like, yeah, uh, that's a really great question. I have a theory that the closer people live to borders, the actually, the, the more accepting they are of border traffic. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I'm going to restate that I was born in Dallas, not near the, near the border, but I did live near the border for a while. And one of those places was Brownsville. And when I was, you know, 15, you used to cross, over to Matamoros to get drunk. And at that time, like, it was pretty common. Like, there was bars that catered to, to 
18 year olds, right? The, the gringos that wanted to go get drunk because you have to be 21 in the U.S. And it was a relatively safe place. Um, I mean, no, not, no more considerable dangerous than, than Brownsville was at the time. As border policy became more strict and more strict, we saw a really interesting phenomenon, and not just in Matamoros, but in Juarez and, and Tijuana, like all of these cities became much, much more dangerous. Because what was that policy doing? It was enabling these criminal groups. And these criminal groups gained so much power that currently they have their tendrils in every aspect of, of daily life in those border cities, right? They have corruption within the police. They have politicians on the payroll. It's, it's just empowered them so much. Um, but interestingly enough, like, I mean, I still have friends in Southern Texas and sure, some of them, like any, any sizable population, you're going to have a wide range of political viewpoints, right? But I feel generally, regardless of whether they're left or right, most of the people that actually live in the border communities are pretty supportive of migration policies, as well as, you know, just through daily exposure, have lots of friends from Mexico, Central America, South America, you know, what have you. And they tend to be a lot more open. And I saw a, the same dynamic here in Colombia when I lived on the Venezuelan border. Cucuta is where I lived. And the culture there is a, is a mix of both countries. You know, you can think about Tex-Mex, if you will. It might not be a perfect analogy. But the culture is a mix of both Venezuela and Colombia. People there are extremely adamant that things were much safer when the border is open than when it's closed. Most of them were pretty pro-migration uh, when it came to Venezuelans in the past. There was a mass exodus from Colombia to Venezuela during Colombia's civil war. So the point that I'm trying to build towards here is that I feel like people who actually live on the border and see border dynamics uh, for both economic reasons, reasons because of trade and stuff like that, but also socially, I think that they're more open to policies that are less restrictive, generally speaking. There are, of course, always exceptions, right? Um I think it's pretty clear, though, what U.S. border policy has done. That's destabilized all of Central America and South America, right? So, for example, we reported from the Darien Gap uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, I went with the reporter. Uh, I didn't cross to Panama. He did. Um, but we did walk. I walked like, three days through the jungle with migrants in, in the landless area known as the Darien in Colombia. And the dynamic there is fascinating, right? It's completely controlled by this armed group called AGC. Um, usually in U.S. media, they call them the Clan del Golfo. They are descendants of the right-wing death squads that fought on the side of the government during the Civil War. And they're now the biggest narco paramilitary gang in the country. And this is the country that produces the most cocaine in the world. These are extremely well-financed, extremely organized paramilitary soldiers, effectively, and they control that region. The Colombian government does not. And they're charging every immigrant that passes. Now, that rate changes from time to time. But if you think that, what was the number last year? I think it was 400,000 people crossed that border, uh, according to data from the Panamanian government. That's an outrageous amount of money. And not just that, they're charging taxes on every businessman who wants to operate in the region. If you're selling camping gear, if you're selling torches, if you're selling water, you run a hotel or a cheap place for them to stay while they're waiting for their chance to cross the ferry. And all of that money, all the boats that take people to those little launching points, all that money is taxed by AGC. What does that do to Colombia and Panama? That destabilizes those governments. I mean, you're giving hundreds of millions of dollars through both drug policy and migration policy to criminal elements in all of these countries, in every country from Colombia to Mexico. And we see it in Mexico. The Mexican government is very complicit, especially the army with cartels and what's going on there. And police are on the payroll. It's just all, this is all direct. Re it's not, I don't think it's fair to say that the U.S. is 100% responsible for this dynamic. But I think it's extremely fair to say that their policy is greatly contributing to making this dynamic worse. And, and this is, migration is one of those factors that's directly tied into this. We see evidence of it. Well, I was going to ask you, how do we kill borders, but also... How do we kill borders? No, I have an answer. It's really easy. <laughs> kill them. Do it. How do we do it? So for 99% of human history, borders only mattered to tax collectors and armies. Picture yourself in, I don't know, southern France 100 years ago, and, and you want to leave France, and you want to go live in Germany. You know what you need? You need a horse. <laughs> 
That's it. That's all you need. <laughs> like, there's no, there's, there are periods where large migrations created xenophobic movements, but this new dynamic where borders are closed and where passports are necessary and visas, it's all very, very new. This is 20th century stuff. For, for 99% of human history, that's not how the world worked. And even if we think about the modern passport, the passport was invented by the UN as a way to encourage global migration. And the idea was that it would be temporary. But what happened is all of these governments realized, like, wait a minute, we can control these borders. This is awesome. Like, this gives us so much more power. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that when you when you build visa barriers or physical barriers or militarization or whatever on these borders, like, it doesn't just keep people out. It keeps, it keeps you in as well. And so... From my perspective, as I kind of talked about in the beginning of this interview, we've created this weird sort of, if you're from the global north, the world's great. You can go to most places. If you fill out the paperwork and bring some money, you can probably get a visa in most countries in the world. You can Your, your opportunities are pretty good. If you're not from one of those wealthy countries, you're stuck. You can go to another poorer country where things might be a little better, or maybe there's less social conflict or political conflict, but you can't access what's really going on in, in the global economic system. And we've created this intentionally. I don't think that was a bunch of men in a back room giggling evilly with like villain mustaches being like, ah, we'll build this. But it's, it's the result of what happened. And that's the system we live in. And so if you're from a place in Central America that the U.S. government doesn't hate, right? Like if you're not from Cuba, if you're not from Nicaragua, you can't get into the U.S. There's just no way. You're not going to get an asylum. You're not going to get a work visa. You're not going to get a school visa. It's a system that's impossible for those people, right? And that just strikes me as really unjust, especially after having spent time at borders. Borders attract the worst people you can imagine, because anyone who's not at a border to travel is there to prey on migrants. And there's no exception to that rule, right? And it's just like you encounter the most vile people. Uh, like the Colombian-Venezuelan border was a great example of that. There were a height of the migration just in Cucuta alone. They were saying that there was 500 troches. Those are like the illegal trails that are controlled by armed groups where they were taxing people to move goods or to leave the country or to whatever. And... They were so valuable at the height of the migration that there was like five armed groups here in a war to control them. And that meant migrants were in the crossfire for physical violence, shootings, bombings, uh, sexual violence, extortion. And, and it just it you can't imagine like a, a more chaotic, violent environment than that and it's all because of border policy like that is a crisis that happened on a border but it's not a crisis that happened because of migration it's a crisis that happened because of state policy right like the laws to try and impede that migration is what created those problems and i just see that dynamic replaying not just on the mexican american border but throughout all of latin america and I'm no expert on other countries outside of that region when it comes to migration, but it certainly seems to be the case there as well. I was just reading about the apparent new plan to put floating barbed wire in the Rio Grande. Ah, um, oh, man. So, yeah, the Houston Chronicle just broke that story. What was that two days ago? Right. Yeah, razor. Yeah, I wish they would remove that paywall so I could get to the whole thing. <laughs> I can send you a, um, a link to it. I think someone sent me one of the archived links. I'll do that after the interview. That would be yeah, I, I mean, you know, it was great to see Americans finally care once about migrant deaths. That's very rare. Usually when there's a bunch of migrant deaths, most Americans are like, eh, whatever. I have to ask you then, do you have the impression that Americans cared a whole hell of a lot more under Trump? And then oh, yeah, for sure. We accidentally forgot to care again. <laughs> this is a point of incredible frustration to me. And that's that liberals were very vocal. When I say liberal, it's almost like a dirty word, by the way. Like, I'm not a liberal. Like, I'm just like, God damn it. Uh, but liberals were very vocal about about migration policy under Trump. They're like, oh, it's the most draconian policy we've ever seen. It's so terrible. It's so terrible. And then as soon as Biden came into office, he's enacted policy that's more draconian. Asylum is basically illegal, right? Like outside of like 10 countries, it's so bad. And I see nothing but silence. But 
Now, I agree with you that that story from the Houston Chronicle was abominable, right? Like it's their pregnant women in razor wire, children being kicked back into the river. There's nothing at all to defend about those actions. They're horrible. And I'm glad to see, you know, people in the U.S. kind of saying how horrible they are. But what they're not talking about is that when Title 42 ended and the asylum system effectively collapsed in the U.S., that was a plan that was proposed by Trump before and was struck down, didn't make it. They thought it was too radical in his administration. Biden did it, right? Like that's more draconian than what Trump did. Now, the diabolically smart part of that move by the Democratic establishment is they pushed most of that migration enforcement away from the border. So now it happens when migrants are trying to get into Mexico, when they're trying to cross the Darien Gap into Panama, when they're trying to cross Nicaragua. All of those countries now are implementing the same draconian policies. And the idea is that less people arrive at the U.S. border. And so far, it's kind of worked. Like, you know. But when the, when the administration brags about detentions being down 70%, which is true, what they're not mentioning is that that's because no one is turning themselves into Border Patrol anymore, because if you do, you'll get kicked out of the country. So we see more crossings that aren't encountered by Border Patrol in regions that are less patrolled and more dangerous, right? And it's very frustrating to me as somebody who doesn't really have a lot of loyalty towards any uh, United States political party, but does care about certain issues a lot. It's very frustrating to me to watch democratic rhetoric. And it was very frustrating to me to see people that created these policies making public statements. I mean, the, the policies I'm referring to under Biden, making public statements about, oh, it's so horrible what Abbott's doing. Well, yes, it is horrible what Abbott's doing, but it's horrible what you're doing. Like, it seems like... It just seems so hypocritical to me. It's very frustrating. To me, it makes it seem like they only cared about Trump being a big meanie as opposed to the actual content or someone as sort of villainous as Stephen Miller, who you know, mm -hmm. sort of del delighted in keeping immigrants out as much as possible. But the status quo bad and the polite bad seems to not really be a concern. Um, yeah, well, I think that I agree completely. I think you're right. I also think that generally speaking, most for most for most U.S. voters, migration isn't a huge priority, right? I mean, there are some people who have strong feelings against it, but it's not a time that you talk to people about what they care about in the U.S., like, right, the five issues you care about most in the United States, most people probably aren't going to write migration on that top five list, right? And that allows for Democrats to do this Oh, but we, we speak nicer about it in publicly. We're not as, we don't say as many mean things, right? So it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, I suppose not caring about it could be transformed into, you know, stopping the, in, the insane border militarization. If people, you know, if it's not on their list of concerns, why don't we have a United States where we don't have this insane border, you know? That's a great question. You know, um, I also feel like the, the trend started in the 90s, right? That's when this, this big militarization against migrants and mass deportation, that's when it all started. But I think that it was really radicalized. And our policy is radical, by the way. Like people, centrists are holding a radical position on that. Like this idea of it's completely different than the, what the United States was as short as 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that it, it became more radicalized after 9-11, right? There was a lot of xenophobia. There was a lot of fear in society that somebody was going to do something like that again. And, you know, on the surface, that seems like a rational fear. Like maybe we should, they just blew up the buildings. Maybe we should keep track of who's coming into the country. But you start looking at the numbers of migration and you look at how many terrorists have entered the country illegally. It's almost none. It's almost none. Like the people who have done things entered legally through legal routes with visas, Right or they were domestic terrorists. So, you know, that argument doesn't seem to be borne out by the actual data, although I understand where that fear comes from, right, and how our society kind of changed after that. I actually find myself more pessimistic about this issue than many others, I think, because it seems like xenophobia is maybe the easiest instrument to wield um, by powerful people, but even more than, you know, warmongering um it's like people don't care maybe most of the time but they can be made to care and made to panic and stuff um, oh i totally agree xenophobia is an extremely useful tool if what your goal is to build a police state extremely useful i mean we see it not just in the united states it was interesting to watch 
how the migration policy in South America, how within the Venezuelans during that whole thing from 2017, it's still going on. Like the highest number of people crossing the Darien Gap today, most of them, not most, the highest percentage of nationalities are Venezuelan. Um, but it's been interesting to watch how xenophobia has risen in the region as a result of that, right? And it makes sense. Like if you're the president of a country and you're having a crime problem, you're like, well, it's the migrants. It's not my fault. This is the migrants. It's not my problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or economic problems or whatever it may be, right? They're a very convenient scapegoat. And making it even more convenient is that most migrants who are recent revi- recent arrivals, even if they arrived formally, most of them can't vote. So it's like, why why wouldn't why wouldn't you demonize them, right? It's like their kids are gonna be mad at you, but that'll be somebody else's problem, right? Like it's, yeah. <laughs> it's just a really vulnerable population when it comes to those kind of po- uh, policies. I mean, in the US we have like the the um, internal immigration checkpoints. Um, and we have, I just, every time I've tried to talk to what you could broadly describe as someone more conservative that like, okay, you don't care about the immigrants, but uh, these, you know, fourth amendment crushing um, borders, mm-hmm. some of whom are literally, some of which are not even on the border, they're inside the United States, also harass you. <laughs> And they still don't care. You might know more than me, but I remember that Border Patrol can operate. What is it within 100 miles of any border? It ends up being two thirds of the American population. Right, 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 which is crazy. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that makes me want to just like, like, you know what? I give up. Fuck it. Like, it's it's absurd. (laughs) And also, you know, surely at this moment on Fox News, someone is talking about Joe Biden's open borders. I mean, yeah, right. And which is just absurd. It's absurd. (laughs) It's 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 just a narrative, that, right? Yeah. No, that that's irritating. Yeah, that's yeah. just not even based in reality. I have a question for you because I've been gone from the U.S. for a while now. I'm looking at it through a telescope, you know, mostly through news reports and social media, and I get that that might not be the most representational view of what's actually going on in America. But it seems to me things are getting crazier there, right? It seems to me that the discourse is becoming more fantastical with claims like Fox News, like you just brought up saying that the borders are open with more violence at protests by the state, as well as, you know, counter protesters clashing. On the outside, it seems like there's more instability, maybe is the word I'm looking for. Certainly more craziness. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. Is that real? Or is that just my perception <laughs> from here? That's a great that's a thing to ponder. I would say the discourse is crazier every day. Like it mm-hmm. never stops increasing in insanity. I'm never quite sure what, you know, the reality is because right. I don't want to be one of those people who's like, well, I heard about a crime. So there must be a crime wave. And now I'm scared. <laughs> you know? A couple of minutes ago, I was reminded of, I think I learned this um, from a reason post. I know you've written for them. Um, it was a clip of the 1980 question mark debate, Republican debate, and Reagan and other people were, they were basically competing over who would sound more welcoming to immigrants, especially on the southern border. It was yeah. another universe. And even George W. Bush, who was heinous, of course, he wasn't quite, he, I mean, there was talk of having a worker program, I guess. You know, I was a teenager, so maybe I don't know mm-hmm. the specifics, but it, that didn't seem as bad either. So it does seem this is that this particular thing is never improving, that it's just mm-hmm. so easy to be terrified. Right. And also with um, climate change, I'm probably going to be OK, you know, for most of my life with climate change, I suspect. I live somewhere that can afford to get sunnier because, uh-huh. you know, I'm worried about the millions and millions of people who are going to have to move and how easy xenophobia will be like, Oh, 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 panic. Oh, there are people moving. I'm scared. You know, I don't know when, but we'll see that probably within our lifetimes. We'll, we'll start seeing migration migrate uh, because of climate change. I mean, we're already starting to, yeah. there are regions that were viable farmland that are no longer throughout, you know, various parts of South America. I also uh, live in a place that's going to be okay for a little bit longer than most of the world. Bogota is at a really high elevation, higher than Denver. It's pretty cold here, actually, which surprises a lot of people about South America. Um, it's also a region with an incredible amount of rain. So it's like these are two things that are going to be, you know, I'll be okay when when mm-hmm. when they're when they're draining someone's corpse for water in <laughs> the part of Colombia. <laughs> I'm joking, uh, but this is this is. <laughs> 
this is something we're going to see in our lifetime. Yeah. Like, I don't think we'll see the end of it. Like, I think that there'll be a point maybe for our kids or our grandkids where things get really bad. But we'll see it, yeah, and that will affect migration. We'll see conflicts over this as well. We'll see conflicts over resources. We'll see conflicts over farmland. It's those scary ideas, and that's coming. And it'll be our job to not be cowed and terrified by the prospect of poor people we have to yeah. interact with. You, I think you've just foreseen uh, <laughs> a rather depressing crisis, but yeah. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't <laughs> I would love to be wrong. Um, I, I agree with you. I would also love to be wrong. I'm thinking about the passports again. You know, it took, I've been, I was a libertarian anarchist for a long time and it still was only until 2013 when they, uh, the U S state department canceled Edward Snowden's passport. And mm-hmm. I was like, Oh yeah. Passports are totally bullshit. Aren't they? <laughs> They're literally permission from your government to go to a different country and they can revoke it. Yeah, that's it's wild. Not, right? That's not, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. It's super wild. I mean, the, I think this is something that a lot of people from the U.S. aren't really, it's a reality they're not forced to confront often, right? This is more common in, in other places. Or, for example, if you have a passport from Colombia, it's like, yeah, you can go to most countries in South America, but as soon as you start getting close to Mexico, they're like, nah, get the fuck out of here, man. So we have these limits on where we can travel that are based on nothing but X and Y coordinates on the map on where we were born. And it just seems so irrational to me. It's a system that I think humans, in, in two or 300 years, they're going to look back on that and just be confused. It's sort of like, who thought slavery was a good idea? Like, who thought that we were just going to, like, make this guy stuck in this tiny part of the world forever? Like, why was that? How did that catch on? You know, it's sort of like, that's, I mean, I look at it that way now. Although I can see how we ended up here and why the system continues to be in place. And as you said, in some ways it gets worse. I'd like to think that eventually we'll be enlightened enough to be like, this is just dumb. This is a bad idea. And the argument I love to make with people who have kind of uh, economic or free market principles is like, this is not a free market system, man. Like if you want to create a free market system, that means that people should be able to vote with their feet, right? They should be able to go get a job somewhere else. And if your company's awesome at getting workers, you can detract them from wherever and like, this is, what we have is a very gamed system, right? Like this is not free market at, by any means. Absolutely. And that's another argument I've desperately tried to make to no avail. Like, again, I come from not the, like the small L libertarian stuff, but the libertarian party was sort of taken over by, I don't know, paleo conservative, whatever they're called, or, you know, border Italians. The U S is a really weird microcosm of I mean, a micro example of libertarian movement more broadly like if you if i have a, for example a friend from india and she's really smart like she has great political opinions and she considers herself a libertarian and she recently well i, I say recently but a year ago arrived to, to new york and has been meeting american libertarians she's like i don't know who these people are like they're not <laughs> libertarians like what <laughs> what is this <laughs> that's Maybe why I can't ditch the word is because there is actually a very surprising range. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But anybody who professes to like a free market and is um, against, you know, isn't in favor of borders, I don't, at this point, I don't know what to do with that. Cause it's yeah, so... it, there's, there's some cognitive dissonance going on there. <laughs> like, there's no other way around it. You know, some other people try to call them commies. Like, you think you own the whole United States? That sounds like commie talk, but it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work on them, no matter how hard you try. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that, that I've had people that espouse that strange viewpoint who have told me, well, if you like immigrants so much, why don't you invite them to your house? I'm like, are you saying that, like, you own the entire United States? Like, what is the argument you're making there? Like, I don't, <laughs> you, it's your personal private property? No, man, that's not how it works. Yeah. Yeah, now I'm trying to decide how optimistic I am because sometimes I think if the human race works out, you know, we'll eventually have a Star Trek future and we'll be like, oh, we used to eat meat, you know, for example. That's weird. Yeah, right. Um, so I like your idea where we're like, you used to just constrain people. That's so weird. But I also have a mighty fear of bureaucracy and it seems like that's one of the things that doesn't, that only increases over as time goes by and it's technology yeah, I agree. helps it. I think that that's the unfortunate destiny of any large organization is like it gets this impetus and this momentum and it just keeps building and building and building and building and building. But you know, sometimes a crisis event comes along and that inspires the revolution. Everyone burns it all down. Who knows what's going to happen? 
which also has its downsides, of course, sometimes. <laughs> well, I do hope you um, manage to destroy all those borders with your reporting. Um, <laughs> I don't think my personal reporting will have much effect on that in my lifetime, but, you know. Well, I sometimes forget the all-important non-Serbian question about cappuccinos. Um, oh. But also, I don't know if you have any media recommendations. You can always send them our way later, but, you know. Uh, you know, just by for pure coincidence... Um, and this ties into what we were talking about. So Cormac McCarthy died recently. I read a lot of his books as a young man and was really influenced by his writing. Uh, because he died, I started rereading the Border Trilogy, which mm-hmm. is All the Pretty Horses, The Crossing, and Cities of the Plain. Um, I would just recommend those. They're great. Like, aside from being a masterful fiction writer, the the underlying theme for all of those books is that borders are dumb. Like we just made them up. They don't do anything. Right. Like there's obviously a lot more going on in the books, but that's one of the themes that goes through them all. And I thought that was kind of a good coincidence for our conversation. I'm an apocalypse fiction fan. So the road, oh, he's got a bunch of that stuff. Yeah. I've been trying to set road. myself up for the road, but yeah. yeah. Oh, and as for cappuccinos, I don't care how they get made or how much, if anything, we have to pay for them, but I want to be able to walk across a place that used to be hard or impossible to walk across like a border and buy one on the other side. In my utopia, you can get a cappuccino anywhere you want and you don't have to be hassled by the police <laughs> to get there. You know what? I'm going to, that's perfect. I can't, can't improve upon that answer. Um, <laughs> would you like to tell the good people, the various internet locations where they might find you and your writings? Yeah, the easiest thing to do is just go to piratewireservices.com. We have a weekly newsletter we put out and bi-monthly features. Um, But we also talk about all the writing the whole pirate crew does there. So if you're looking to find out more about any of our work, uh, every every newsletter has links to all of that. Um, That's probably the easiest place. You can also find my Twitter there and all the other random millions of new social media sites and I have no idea which one's going to succeed. Well, yes, I am now following your stuff and I'm going to read it more. Cool. Thanks. Because damn it, I've been to Guatemala and Belize and I would love to go again and go more Southernly and I probably will. So yeah, let's get a, let's get a cappuccino in uh, Bogota. You know what? Let's do that. I love it. Um, uh, I would love to talk again sometime, but thanks for being my guest today. No, thank you so much. It was a really fascinating conversation and a pleasure. I've been following you on Twitter, but it's nice to put a face to the name as well and a voice. Agreed, agreed. Right back at you. Um, as usual, humans follow non Serbium, non Serbium Media, all one word, on Twitter if you know it still is alive. We're on Blue Sky now, we're on Mastodon, follow me on Twitter, Lucy Stag, etc. If you want to. Um, And uh, join us next time. You're listening to the Non Serbian Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform? You can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much. <laughs>